Welcome to the Stat Med Podcast, where we teach you how to study in med school and how to pass board style tests. Your hosts are Ryan Orwig and David LaSalle, learning specialists who have decades of experience working with med students and physicians. In this episode, Ryan and Dave continue their conversation on the 13 ways people can go wrong when taking board style tests. If you haven't checked out our previous episodes on this topic, be sure to. This episode is just one of a multi-part mini-series on test-taking missteps. I think one of the big reasons that rounding down happens is that when we are reading a question, there's a lot of information in there and we want everything. So if we're trying to grab and hang on to more than our working memory can handle, then again, our brain's going to try and help us out. And the way that it's going to help us out is it's going to take things that are these weird specific shapes and it's going to sand off all those rough edges so that it will fit and we can kind of hang on to it, kind of hang on to it generically in working memory. And then we've taken the very specific clues that the question writer has given us and we have turned them into these sort of bland generic clues and we can make of them whatever we want to. Here are Ryan and Dave. Hey, Ryan Orwig and David LaSalle here with StatMed Learning. We talk about studying, timing, and testing in medical education. And today we're going to talk about types of test-taking misses, bad test takers experience. The next mistype is what we call a misread, which is because it's a misread. Yes, reading something wrong. (laughs) Yeah, 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 uh, guess what? That's bad. Uh, But... uh, Gosh, it's and this 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 can apply up in our first phase. It can apply apply in the second phase when you're down the answer options. Probably can happen in various ways in the third phase tie break. Um, and it, I mean, again, it's I, I gotta laugh because it's like misreads are bad. But right, don't do that. Yeah, yeah. So what can we say about misreads? Well, I I, I so there there are certainly people with um, you know organic. Uh, reading differences where you're going to, you're going to be dealing with a, a, a diagnosed uh, reading disability. And that's, that's a, that's a whole different set of remediation uh, tools that you're going to need access to. So we, but, can, then we can help with, uh, within, a, within a certain scope. Yeah. Um, but we're talking okay. more generally, right? Yeah. For folks who, who aren't uh, um, dealing with those particular issues, I think that misreads oftentimes happen for two specific reasons. I think that people are sprinting and therefore are more prone to misreading. And I think that people are multitasking and are therefore more prone to misreading. So you mean is- by, by, by multitasking, you're talking about more of a discrete multitasking within the question, not, not reading questions and listening to music and playing on their phone. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. The sprinting is obvious. This is like, I've got to get, you know, I've got to get this question done because I'm sick well, of questions or because the clock is ticking or whatever. Like that one's pretty, pretty straightforward. Well, and, yeah. and let me just jump in on the sprinting. We think yeah. that, I think a lot of lay people think that reading is like a, like a laser scanner, like a barcode scanner where it's like bzzz across the thing. So we think the lay person might think if I want to read faster, I just need to bzzz, go across faster, mm-hmm. but that's not how reading works. Reading the, the, the eye itself cannot capture a fixed image print on the screen or the page while the eye itself is moving. So we, we read in these snapshots, snapshot, slide over, snapshot, slide over. Faster readers run on really tight rails and they have larger, these, these fixation snapshots. They, they have, they, and, they, and so, but then if, you're, if you are more of a choppy stepper with your reading with really small fixations, you grab one word, you jump over other words, you grab another word, you jump over and grab another word, right? So when the sprint happens, yeah, you're grabbing this word, zoop, you're grabbing another one, you know, sprinting to the next lily pad is your lily lily pad jumping here, and your brain autofills. I mean, imagine if we only if our communication or interpretation depended on when we're texting somebody for the autocorrect autofill function. Go, gobbledygook, you know, yeah. crazy, all kinds of miscommunication. So that, so I think that's one manifestation of yes. re- sprinting, reading too fast. Heavens knows what's going to happen. In, in, in the wake of that kind of thing. And then, so a good, a really good reader is going to identify this doesn't make sense. Right. And then I need to go back and, and correct it. But you, the ticking time bomb clock, all the other stuff can be happening within this. I mean, and, and our, our brains are decent at autofilling with things that do make sense. 
mm-hmm. too. My brain yeah. will plug in something else that fits, that, 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 that fits the context. Yes, but it isn't fair. actually what's on the page. Yeah. So Especially that if you leads me to pick an answer and feel actually okay about it. Yeah, that's true. Maybe it's less gobbledygook and it's more like in the, in the, in the neighborhood. But yeah. in the neighborhood is, is dangerous on yeah. a test question. Because they're yeah, worse than way off. Yeah. Yeah, because the wrong answers are, are in the same neighborhood, at least at least at least some of them are. Um, yeah. So, so yes, uh, uh, with regard ahead. to that multitasking we were talking about, it, it is exactly what you were saying. Basically, uh, that idea that I misread answer C uh, because my brain was still churning on answers A and B, or because my brain was already leaping ahead to answers D and E, and I couldn't wait to get the question done. I was thinking about the question globally instead of just staying focused on working exactly the answer I was working at that moment. So my, I, I kind of think of our brains while we're testing as like, like an old clunky PC, you know, where like it can run one program just fine. But yeah. if I start trying to run a whole bunch of stuff in the background, it's going to get buggy quick. So I think if I'm trying to read and process answer C, and think about what I know about answer C and connect it to the clues up above. Like that's a complex enough program to do yeah. without also worrying about, was I right about answer B and was that a stronger answer than this one or thinking about the question as a whole, all at the same time. I think that yeah. that oftentimes when we see misreads, I think that's what's going on. Well, and then you can tie, I mean, I, you can tie these misreads into anything. So let's say I'm working a question about this kid with, all these issues, um, including, you know, let's say it's asking about lesions of the skin. Mm-hmm. And let's say the prompt is like, you know, analysis of the skin lesions will most likely tell us that they are blah, blah, blah. That's like, the, that's the prompt, the last sentence being asked. Well, you could misread that into, I mean, it ties back into a prompt misread the last, and, and turn it into what's wrong with this kid. You might mm-hmm. see neurofibromas in the answer options, which would be a type of skin lesion, I guess. And then you start reading it as what's wrong with this kid, because I misread the prompt and turn in, I'm turning into what's wrong with the kid. And then I see neurofibromas and I start thinking neurofibromatosis, which is a diagnosis. Yep. And now I'm reading it to shape, and I, you know, obviously I've gone out of order. We're not using our sequence because we're looking at the answer options, we're thinking about them. And then you're reading it like da 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 da, and then you're triangulating, and it sort of kind of fits this diagnosis of neurofibromatosis. It's not even asking what's, they're not asking about the diagnosis. They're asking about a type of skin lesion that is clearly delineated in, in one of the sentences. And you're, and you're just taking that description of the lesion and putting it as, oh, these kind of lesions could be with neurofibromatosis. And now all of a sudden you're picking that. So you've now misread neurofibromas as neurofibromatosis, you've misread the prompt as asking most likely diagnosis. And now you've made multiple misreads and you've worked out. And that's, that's your brain, like trying to be too helpful, trying to be like, well, neurofibromas doesn't work. It doesn't fit what I'm thinking, but neurofibromatosis does. So let's turn it into that. It's like when you, you go get a sandwich and somebody's like, trying to be super helpful. And so they throw a whole bunch of extra mayo on there because they're like hooking you up because they love mayo. That's what your brain is doing. Your brain's like, it's trying to help too much, you know? That's horrible. Um, yeah, it's horrible. Uh, <laughs> and it's it's adaptive for, again, for most of the reading I do in my life, it doesn't matter that much if I misread a word or two here or there. And I appreciate the fact that my brain will will sort of patch over those gaps for me because yeah, generally I'm reading, right. Generally it's fine. Yeah, I don't know how reading a novel would work if it didn't do that. Right. Uh, but this is such a specific reading activity engaging with these very specific textual constructs and it requires very specific reading strategies and if you are not using the right ones and the right balance and the right combination for your brain's needs it's going to lead to a lot of issues including these misreads so again and misreads can happen up and down the up and down the chain so i think we talked about how that might look so the idea of how to fix misreads is to, I, get, I think, installing a robust system that limits burden on your processes, learning how to identify when and how they're happening, reflecting on them, and then really building strategies around them 
to buffer those uh, those occurrences. It's probably again it's sort of a you got to have a new system in place that gives you feedback so we can see where within the scope these are happening, how often they're happening, and then through reflection build self monitoring skill uh, mechanisms. That's that pro that's probably how we do it because because you take some people that are really rampantly bad with this and we can really cut them way down, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, right. I, I think a lot of a lot of it comes down to getting people to focus on what they are working at that moment, what the step is, is that they need to be focused on at that moment. Um, uh, doing that one task at a time. I think that that, that really does help uh, reduce the number of misreads. Yeah. A misread is more of just a symptom of other larger systemic problems yeah. often. And so if you fix the system, it helps reduce the misreads. Um, and again, if it's if you have like a, like a like a reading disorder or something like that, you just have to almost there, there there's like there's probably going to be depending on the nature of the reading disorder um, could be fixing the structural stuff helps offset it or you just have to get tighter everywhere else to account for whatever kind of loss you're going to have there um, yeah. those kind of mistakes right. All right, so another mistype that we see with bad test taking is what we call a single point of contact. Um, and this is where you build all of your comprehension around a single clue, usually in the in the passage itself, up in the clinical vignette itself. You grab onto that one clue and you build off. It's kind of an opposite of a triangulation. Uh, so we want people to maybe pick three. You offset that by picking three clues. And again, it's not a perfect fit fix, but it does fix it. So how might you see some of these single point of contact misses happening? What would, what would you say about that, Dave? Well, I mean, I, I come back to the idea that so much bad testing is emotionally driven. And I think that people who are oftentimes making single point of contact errors are reading questions a little desperately. They're reading questions hoping that something's going to connect and they're so excited when something does. It's just yeah. a, something clicks right in and it feels great and it's exciting and aha, I found the thing and I recognize it and I know it's associated with this and it's this huge like relief that floods my system. But then what happens is I am pinning everything on one clue. And we know in these vignettes, there's more than one clue. You know, Well, we know and, and the way that these questions are built, wrong answers are designed to be partially correct. Right. So, yeah, you're grabbing onto this one thing you're, and, and that, 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 you know, that facilitates ruling answer options in instead of ruling answer options out. And our, a key tenet of our, of our philosophy is that we want to learn how to rule options out. Ruling them in is just a very, you're playing with fire. I'm yeah. sure it'll work sometimes, but it's not going to work over the course of the exam. So yeah, you get this like really excitable, like, like oh, you can rule it in, and then you're going to ignore other clues. You're, I mean, by, by definition, if you're single point of contacting it, and we see this all the time, right? All well, the time. I, I grabbed onto this, and this fit, and ooh. Yep. Yep. Yeah, and it might be, it might be, so it might be somebody who just isn't doing great process. They aren't doing a neutral read and a triangulation. They're just grabbing one clue. They see it. They get so excited. They go to the answers. They pick that answer and move on. Right. That's, that's like the gross version of it. The subtler version of it is somebody who is doing their process. They're going through the paces and mm -hmm. they do grab three triangulation points, but really the whole time they're just so excited about that one triangulation point. And they already know it's going to fit so nicely with this answer. You know, um, well, and you're I, using I, the word you're using the word excited, and it, it could be like a true excitement feeling, or it could be more of a stealth excitement, like a relief mm -hmm. excitement. But yeah. I, I, I do think so many test takers are secretly hoping every time they open a question, say, I don't know, you know, opening a present on your birthday from a bunch of like grandparents, and you're like, as a kid, like, like, like for me, it'd be like, please be a toy, like, please right. be, a toy. right? Oh, like. Shirts. It's going to be pajamas. Grass. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, an electric toothbrush. Oh, my. Thank you. But yeah. I guess this hope, this hope that you're going to get something, right? Yeah. And I think there's this like hope of like, just please jump out. Please yeah. just jump out and tell me that it's this thing that I know and I can run with it. And that, that's, that's, a, it's more of a stealthy excitement, but it's still an excitement nonetheless. So, yeah. yeah so that's, that, that's, I think, a big, a big, this underlying cause of the single point of contact, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I call that the click. Like when you're 
playing with Legos or you're putting together like Ikea furniture and you're like struggling to get things to fit. And then all of a sudden something clicks into place and you're like, Ooh, it fits. Ah, thank goodness. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it's, it is, it's a little exciting. It's all stealthy, exciting, maybe. Um, and I don't think the click necessarily means that your theory is wrong. It doesn't necessarily mean that, that it's not right. what you're thinking, but it right. also doesn't necessarily mean that it's right. Uh, you know, for a lot of people that, that, that we work with, I think the click is just an indicator that I better be careful to check that theory against the rest of my clues because I know myself and I know I get excited when one clue matches really nicely. But the key is at the end of the day, it does not matter how well any one clue matches. It doesn't matter. What matters is, do all my clues match? And again, uh, if it falls too much, that's where the, we use a triangulation with just three clues. Right. At least push on three. But I, I, you know, I think of like, if I, it's like, I don't know, if I built a tree house for my kids, I wouldn't just be like, and I'm not really good with my building physical things. I wouldn't be like, get up there and try that tree house out, kids. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully it holds up. Yeah. So, you, you know, you, I would have, I would have to get up there and jump around in it because if it holds me, then it's going to hold them. So you want to, you don't want to just have blind faith that my, my initial clue is going to hold up. Right. I want to, yeah. I want to, like, I want to try to tear it down instead of just, you know, hope that it holds up under pressure. Right. Um, yeah. So can, I, can I talk about a, can I talk about a special case here? Um, yeah. Because it is something that comes up pretty regularly is okay. I think that questions that are very prone to single point of contact are questions including images. I think that oftentimes when people see images, they get so excited about the image and the excitement could be a positive or a negative excitement. You know, some people are like, oh good, there's a picture that's gonna help. Some people are like, oh no, I hate these pictures. Uh, whatever, whatever that form that excitement takes. I think the number one error that I see people make when dealing with questions with images is that they overinvest in the image. So that is a couple of potential outcomes, right? Either there's a clue in that image and I just get super excited about that clue. I see it, I identify it, I get super excited about it and I build my whole theory on that one clue and disregard anything that maybe doesn't match it. Or I look at the image and I'm not exactly sure what's going on and that might lead me to overinterpret the image to force myself to see things there that aren't really there so that I can feel okay about that clue. Right. I should have second when you're saying like, I can't really tell what's going on here. And if that's the case, you should go down to the, 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 the actual text and triangulate there. And so like, I'm going to make there be a something I can take from this. Yeah. Yes. Real you're yeah. twisting. Right. Like that shadow might be a uh, uh, tumorous. And so I'm going to decide that it is. Build right? everything around, build everything around this real, you know, shaky take yes. on something. Yes. And then, you know, the final thing that, that can happen when we look at an image, right? Sometimes we're like, oh, I got it. I know what it is. Sometimes we're like, oh, I'm not exactly sure, but let me go over invest it with me. Sometimes treat about that in, in response to the clue. Like, oh, this is a tumor. This is a fracture. As opposed to, I don't know, maybe, oh, this, this, this little thing here. Well, maybe that's a tumor. Da, 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 da. Maybe that's a those are two very discreetly different responses yes. and they need to identify that. Yes. Yeah. And then the final sort of, sort of uh, uh, response I see with images is that people look at the picture and they say, Oh my gosh, I don't know what this is supposed to be showing me. And because they've invested so much significance in that picture, then it's just tailspin. Mode. And, then, and then they don't do a diligent process down in right. passage. Yeah, no, that that's just like I've I've i I'm already drowning. I'm because already the, drowning because the picture goes. because yeah. the picture is so confounding to them, they're out. It yeah. spins them out. Yeah. And then just another random thing about images. So we talk so much, you know, we're looking at this through the filter of the way the brain reads and processes textual information. Um, I was working with a radio or some sort of radiologist a, a year or two ago. And it was fascinating because their stuff is largely just images, maybe with a, a few sentences. He was doing single point of contacts on these images. Yeah. He would grab onto this one thing up here and then miss it because he'd fill in all the other stuff. It could be, oh, yeah. that's, but I'm like, well, well, okay, you picked A, D is right. Why are they saying D is right? Well, they're saying it's right because of this. Well, oh, could you have gotten that from this picture? Because I'm assuming he just didn't know it. He's like, oh, no, yeah. actually this and this means... Oh yeah, well these two don't go with A. 
I'm like, so if you just triangulated, so it gave him a search and find uh, process. And so he might, so he'd go to a question. So we just added, like, you've got to triangulate on, on these on these things, which is what he would do in real life. It's just the weird way some of these doctor brains work on these, these, these artificial constructs. So he's like, all right, I, I'll see the picture. Boom. And, oh, there's really nothing else. Okay, okay, fits. Boom. Oh, no, nothing else. Oh, oh, oh. And then it just built out. So the stuff that's happening reading-wise can happen text-wise. Same, same phenomenon. And that, that's, I mean, that, those are a little more fringe examples. That's great. I love that. But it does translate on, yeah. it's the same, same phenomenon. Yeah. So anyway. Yeah. For, so, for, but for most testers who are not taking a radiology board, right. for most testers, the most that an image is going to provide me is one triangulation point. Right? right. So I think, I think we just need to keep images in their proper context. Yeah, and we look yeah. at it and, and we say, and then, right, and then there, scale, there a triangulation point? right, and then to scale back out to just single point of contact. If that's an issue, yeah. what you probably want to do to fix it is say, okay, this, what, why, what did I pick? Why did I pick it? How did that hurt me? And then, okay, if I, I mean, maybe like I picked fever and vomiting or something that's like really low, like almost like wild card can be anything. Uh, but then I say, well, what are the other two things I could have picked that would have really helped me um, or, you know, three things other, otherwise just build out that. Cause if you keep doing that, you're going to just get better at picking out the better clues. Um, mm -hmm. And again, I don't think it's like you got to pick the perfect three clues. Um, it's just, a, it's a way to give you some three dimension, three, uh, like a three dimensional perspective as, a, as opposed to a two dimensional, um, yeah. which is really important in these situations. Fair. Yeah. And I, and I, I think also learning, to recognize that that reaction we might have to a single clue isn't necessarily a, a, a big flashing sign leading us to the right answer, which I think it, it very easily can feel like. Yeah, you know, I think that's, that's a type. That's a type of bad test taker who's falling into that. Again, yeah. over and over and over, infinite mix. Yeah. So we've got to learn through reflection to, to get better at it. Good, so that, that wraps that one up. So another one, would be the rounding down. So mm -hmm. number seven is rounding down key clues. Rounding down can happen in the in the in, in the the prompt, the last sentence. It can happen in the passage itself. It can happen within answer choices. So rounding down is taking something nuanced and complex, and then rounding it down to something smooth and generic and less less than what it is. Um, very dangerous. Is yeah. a bad is a bad one. So, what can you say about this one? Um, I, I guess the first thing that comes to mind for rounding down is I think one of the big reasons that rounding down happens is that when we are reading a question, there's a lot of information in there, and we want everything. So, yeah. if we're trying to grab and hang on to more than our working memory can handle, then again, our brain's going to try and help us out. And the way that it's going to help us out is it's going to take things that are these weird specific shapes and it's going to sand off all those rough edges so that it will fit and we can kind of hang on to it, kind of hang on to it generically in working memory. And then yeah. we've taken the very specific clues that the question writer has given us and we have turned them into these sort of bland generic clues and we can make of them whatever we want. Yeah, they, they, they become wild cards. Yeah, they become yeah. wild cards. So they can fit whatever we want. And that's where people say, well, I mean, I, I, I narrow down to three and it could be any of them, or I narrow down to two and I'm always picking the wrong one. Well, if you've rounded down clues, then it's going to help you push away from something you don't know as much about and maybe fit something you know more about. And then that's one of these many patterns we see with these, these sort of tie break fails. Um, and there's a whole medley of those things. Uh, but if you fix everything up top earlier in the sequence, before you get to tie breaks, that's going to fix a lot of the problems. And then there are better ways to fix tie breaks. Yeah, rounding down is probably due to working memory limitations. Um, so you're taking something complex and really squishing it down. Um, like if you have somebody who's fainting multiple times during varsity soccer practice and you turn down to, you know, faints at school, you know, 
it's, it's very different, you know? If you have somebody that has a very descript specific description of a rash, and then you turn that into rash. I mean, think about, I mean, like you've just invalidated so much of, of what you're dealing with. And again, no, people would say like, I, I, I would never do that. Like that'd be really, it's obviously a really bad idea, of course, but it's, it's due to the way we're processing this textual information and trying to hold on to it. So again, you have to learn to see if this is a problem for you. It's really easy to do. You do a handful of questions and then you look at the ones you missed and you're like, wow, like this says purple spots on the buttock and I picked toxic shock syndrome, and I know toxic shock syndrome is not purple spots on the butt. Like, I know that. So how did I do this? I, that was just a stupid mistake. No, it wasn't a stupid mistake. Like, that's not helpful. Um, what happened was you turned this very specific description of a rash into a rash. And then you said, well, this is a rash. Yes, yeah, so boom, I'm in, and other, other symptoms fit. Um, it could be like when you, I mean, it could, it could be as few as two or three words on the answer option that gets rounded down to one word. And you're like, well, yeah, but if I, I looked at this and I ruled it in, but if I looked at this, I would have ruled it out. I mean, it can happen up and down the chain. So I, I think that For rounding sure. down is a, is, is a really, this is definitely one of the silent killers throughout. And again, it can happen all, all the way up and down the chain. Any other thoughts on, on rounding down? Uh, I mean, it, it just comes back to my mantra that in testing, the general is our enemy. The specific is our friend. If you think about how much real estate these these question writers have, how much space they have to give us information, uh, they're choosing their words specifically and deliberately to point us toward the right answer and away from wrong answers. So yeah. if we round them down, we're not using the tools that we're given. And I think that that, that happens sometimes because we start treating the question globally instead of zooming in and using the specifics that are in there. Uh, right. So I think, I think we just keep pinning ourselves again and again back to the specific language that is actually in the passage, in the prompt, in the answer option that we're working at that moment. Yeah, and I think, I think just by installing a system that limits burden on working memory and makes us sort of break things into something we can focus on, it's going to help reduce the occurrence of these. It's not going to make it go away automatically. Right. Um, but again, this isn't something everybody does, but there's a, a few very specific types of bad test takers that definitely do this. And again, I don't think it's readily apparent to them yeah. on their own. It doesn't seem like it, right? Well, and, and yeah, because all, all of these error types are adaptive strategies that worked previously in testing, right? Yeah. Like you can get through undergrad by rounding down questions uh, or, or piece, pieces of questions, and it, it'll, it'll be functional enough, yeah. right? Like these questions, uh, the questions when you're working on a, on a medical board exam, they're so specific. There's so much information in that question that we have to keep sharp and specific. So what used to work isn't going to work anymore. I think that's well, something- the, the wrong answers are so close to each other. Whereas yeah. in a lot of testing constructs, they're a lot farther apart from each other, I think. Uh, it's probably part of the the rub. And again, second and third order, uh, the demand on inferences, um, it, it, it just becomes this. Yeah, this is probably not a problem before because the the design, the textual build of the construct didn't really push and burden on that. And now it is all. And so yeah. you, this is a thing that was might have always been a weakness for somebody that now is opening up and just blowing up in their face consistently on the test. Um, so to fix it, yeah, I mean, I, I would, I think you almost have to, this is more of a top-down fix where you limit burden on working memory across the board, and then you tactically start seeing if this is happening, then start attacking it from there uh, to fix it. Sounds good. So another test taking miss, this is a pretty popular one for us, is what we call the twist. This is when you take a clue that doesn't fit something and make it fit, or you, it's a clue that's just up there and you manipulate it. So the idea is you can make a square peg fit in a round hole if you hit it hard enough, which is, I think, and again, like maybe, and it's like, it's like chicken or egg stuff too. Like, did I twist that because I wanted it to fit an answer option or did I just twist it because I twisted it? Mm -hmm. It's where you're taking this clue, and again, this happens in the passage, it can happen 
Uh, and, and the answer opposite can happen with concrete clues, can happen with the way you're thinking about how things connect. It can happen in um, with a prompt. It can happen with tie break process. So a twist is when you're adding additional information to the equation of the passage and the scenario and the answer options that is not inherently there in black and white. So if an inference is good, you have to be able to infer certain things. So an inference is something that the overwhelming majority of people are gonna read and say, this equals this. A twist is whenever you've added something that, you know, not everybody can infer because you've, you've added to, this, to the scenario. So what, what can you say about the twist? Yeah. I, I, I... I agree with that definitely. Like it's an it's an inference taken to a troublesome extreme. Like we've gone past reading between the lines, and now we're we're writing in between the lines. We're adding information. Yeah, can't harder. Be, can't. Yeah, harder, oftentimes for doctors, I think, to avoid twisting than it is for students to avoid twisting. I think that oftentimes people's clinical experience um, pushes them to twist, where where they're like recognizing their patients in these yeah. hypothetical vignettes. And so they're importing all of this external experience into the question. So it, it, it's it's paradoxically it, it's tougher. Uh, you know, the more clinical experience you have, sometimes it, it's tougher to work these questions because we're not looking for the real world answer or the analog that you had in your clinic last week. We're looking for the textbook response. Um, so I think it's it's easy to start importing that stuff. Yeah, uh, oh, for sure. But, but but that's not to say, of course, that our you know step someone taking step one for the first time sure. isn't twisting like a like like crazy. And yeah. this is where you're going out of out of the bounds. You can't see the boundary lines of like where the inference ends and then where the twist begins. So like you were saying, like if you have somebody that's feigning multiple times at varsity sports practice. That's that that should tell us like there's an inference to be drawn there. Like this person is feigning when during exertion. If they said at like after practice, it, does after practice mean like turn? I like guess the heart rate stuff. It makes it it, it it makes it a lot a lot less valid to say that's during exertion. That would probably invalidate the question. If somebody says that they're feigning multiple times at school. And you've got to say like, well, okay, no, here's a better one. If it says you're fainting multiple times during ping pong at school, does that mean, and you might say like, well, you know, that means like maybe they're sitting down and standing up and going over and then they're, I don't know, like, like vasovagal, they're dropping, but something that I, and I'm like, and it's like pretty leisurely. So why would you be pat? Like, this isn't a valid question scenario at all. But but then I might say, oh no no like ping pong to me at school that's intense. There was like money being exchanged. There was like sweat. Like people's heart rates were. Uh, like, that's not valid. You can't say that. You can't you can't use ping pong at school to imply to expect the person to infer intense cardiovascular exercise. Even saying kicking a ball around is probably not not valid because it's not a universal like your heart rate is up but varsity practice indicates that sort of thing so you've got to see where uh the, the something that is, is an inference that everybody should draw versus you know these things that you add what if but maybe all that jazz right yeah i i, I didn't tell you this i had a client the other day um it was great uh we have a question that is analogous to this, like the 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 varsity soccer practice that we use um, in lecture. And I had a client working that question, and uh, she decided that this kid who was fainting during the during the varsity soccer practice had a um, an eating disorder. And the reason that that made sense was that uh, this girl had a crush on her coach, and was in the process of trying to like drop weight and look good for her new coach on the soccer team. And I pointed out to her, like, we have no idea. This coach, this coach might be an 88 year old woman. We have no idea. Uh, this coach could be her mom. We just don't know. So anytime we set that up where, where all the stars have to line up just so in order to make that answer, right. You know, like, well, it could be an eating disorder if 
This girl had uh, yeah. body issues and the coach was new and it was a young person just what out if, of college. It was very attractive and, and, and. Right, it's, it's what if. We're heading down the path. What if is yeah. the connector that links you off? And again, it can't be something that everybody, yeah. I mean, and, and people, usually once they start having to articulate it, yeah, they realize like, oh. But then, but it, it, are, yeah, it's like, oh, it's embarrassing. But then, or it's like, okay, now write out these things you think are there. Now go back to the black and white print and tell us what's actually there. Yep. And and it's pretty good because I, I, I mean, teaching inferences is actually like really hard. Like how to draw inferences. It's like a, it's a key deep reading skill. Most of our students do un, are capable and, and, and able, obviously, but they just sometimes have been engaging in this unchecked behavior where they're actually twisting and they're getting no feedback. So again, if somebody does this, what they do is you write out how you missed it and then you write out how you should have worked it. And that kind of iterative uh, self-reflection will lead to better self-monitoring to help extinguish this negative twisting behavior. Uh, but man, it's a it's a it's a good one. I mean, it's got to be so like if I if I were a med student and if, or a physician, I would have been a twister. Mm -hmm. I would like I I would have uh, butchered these things. Like I, I like I, I'd be like I'm a you know I I think that's why I'm good at this is that I I would probably have done all these things. Yeah. Um, but I would have, I would have twisted the heck out of stuff. But again, especially if nobody's like sitting there. Now I, I I like to think that I'd be really coachable. Maybe that means I'm like the least coachable person. Who knows? But I think if someone had, would be able to sit down and explain to me the rules and the patterns, like that would be really empowering to me. And that's sort of how I built all this stuff. But I, I mean, if nobody's explaining to you and you're just off doing questions on your own and reading the explanations, like, dang it, missed it again. Yeah. I was stupid. Why yeah. do I keep doing this? I mean, yeah, it, it does lead to this, this, this horrible feeling. So it's like the idea of like, every time you touch something that's like, that's like metallic and black, it burns you. Or no, every, every okay, every now and then you touch something that's metallic and black and it burns you, you're eventually gonna become paranoid of everything that's metallic and black until someone explains to you, oh no, that's the burner on the stove. Oh, don't touch that. But if you don't know why you're getting these negative shocks, these negative, this negative feedback, it's gonna make you feel terrible, it's gonna make you not trust yourself, it's gonna make you hate the, te the test, it's gonna make you hate the test makers, and then you're trying to get into their heads, which we don't want to do. Uh, just keep keep that clean interface and learn how to get feedback on how you're missing these things. But but twisting has got to be something just this absolutely maddening. And once you can learn the rules for it and how to identify it after you do it, then you can get control of it. And it brings everything back down if that's one of the things that's happening to you. Yeah. Can I can I add just one thing because it, it just crossed my mind. It's one of my favorite quotes that a, that a client ever uh, ever said oh, yeah. to me. So he was analyzing this process and he said, I have to remember that when I am working these questions, I'm like a doctor on ER, not a doctor on house, meaning I'm doing like middle of the road medicine. I'm doing stuff that like everybody who sees these clues, that's what we're going to see. I'm not solving obscure medical mysteries. I'm not going to read the answer explanation and be like, oh my gosh, that's brilliant. Like that's sure, that's some Sherlock Holmes stuff there. Like it shouldn't be like that. We don't have to bring that much baggage in to put all the clues together. We just want to take what's there and uh, and see what it adds up to. Yeah, and it, and it can be something that's like, you know, closer to a zebra than a horse, but it still has to fit what that, whatever that, that diagnosis is. Yeah. And it's not like you have to do all these, like, like with house, I guess, it's just doing like these crazy backflip somersault uh, finding these like like you know Sherlockian level of of of, of connections to, to 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 get to solve the mystery right that must be what right. what what that means and it's more like yeah like let's just cut right through it boom 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 and and work to the most logical and that's why it's like most likely most mm -hmm. appropriate are so incredibly integral to the, the, this whole textual construct working. It's not asking what could it be, you know? Right. It's like, given these limited clues, what's most appropriate, what's most likely? And that will help, I think, keep us in line in, in general, but especially in regards to twisting, right? Absolutely. Power of the prompt. Yep. Yeah. Back to that prompt, that last, that last question being asked, anchoring back to it. 
um, we'll, we'll take you through. Thanks for tuning into this episode of the StatMed podcast. In future episodes, Ryan and Dave will discuss additional ways test takers can go wrong on the boards. If you liked this show, be sure to rate it on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcast. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. You can find more test taking and studying strategies specifically designed for med students and physicians over at our blog on statmedlearning.com. Thanks for listening. Hey there, Ryan Orwig from StatMed Learning. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, we'd appreciate it if you'd hit the thumbs up button below, and we'd love to hear from you, so leave us a comment with your thoughts. To make sure you don't miss future studying and test taking tips for the medical field, be sure to subscribe to our channel. And when you do, turn on alerts by clicking the bell icon. Thanks again.